there's actually a deep irony at the heart of this psalm, and it points to the deep irony, the hilaritas, that's at the heart of God's dealing with humankind throughout all of Scripture, and it's this. Israel was not a great nation. So this psalm talks about Israel being uh, the inheritance of the nations, their king being mighty and great, but Israel was in fact the exact opposite. If you read Scripture, Israel was the small, tiny nation that was often caught in a perilous existence between nations and empires that surrounded it that were so much more powerful than they. And so the history of Israel is often that they, they were lived under the threat of extinction and that they only survived because of the grace and the faithfulness of God. And God says as such in Deuteronomy when he chooses Israel, he says in Deuteronomy 7 through Moses that God chose Israel not because they were numerous, but because they were small. God chose Israel not because they were great but because and, and strong, but because they were weak. And so this psalm points to the irony that Israel, this small, um, almost powerless nation, will be the nation that inherits all the great empires of the world. And we even see that when God says, I have set my king to enthrone him on, on Zion, my holy hill. Zion was not a great mountain of a great capital city of a great empire. Zion is actually a pretty modest mountain. Um, uh, of a, small, of a small nation with a small capital city. And yet God chooses Israel, the last and the least, as the nation through which he will reveal himself to the world. And again, we see this, this deep hilaritas, this irony, this deep comedy come to fulfillment in Jesus Christ. Jesus, the last and the least, who is enthroned now as King of Kings and Lord of Lords. Jesus was but not born of a, of a noble uh, birth uh, of uh, into an elite family. He was born to an unwed mother. He had a scandalous birth. Uh, it was said of Jesus, what good can come from Nazareth? He's from a no-name backwater town. Who is this guy? Jesus, who hung out with the tax collector and the sinner and the adulterer. Um, Jesus was the opposite of what Israel was expecting in their Messiah, because again, that's the way that God works. From the beginning, God has been inverting how we think, uh, turning upside down what we think about power, what we think about might. Uh, he, he's been challenging us and confronting us, his people, to think differently about how the world works. And we see this confrontation, this contrast, come uh, to, to a stark clarity on the cross. On the cross, this contrast uh, this chasm between the way of the world and the way of God is, is revealed in its fullest, where the world, uh, all the religious and the political leaders, right, they, they conspire and they plot against Jesus and, the, and they, they marshal all that they can, right, the, the full might of the Roman Empire, the full might of the religious leaders of Jerusalem, and they decide what we can do, the height of our power is to kill. That's what we can do. That's, that's still how we define power in the world, right? The, the most powerful nation is that with the biggest army, the nation that can kill the most. And that's how we define power in this world. And yet, on the cross, God, who appears powerless in Jesus, right? They, they, the crowds cry out, if you can save yourself, if you're the king, save yourself. Come down from the cross. So Jesus looks powerless and helpless in the face of the world's power. And yet, God is actually revealing that at what lies at the heart of the universe, what lies at the heart of the cosmos, the power that infuses this world is not that uh, of, of what this world thinks. It's actually the love of God displayed in Jesus Christ. That's at the heart of the world. That, that's at the heartbeat of our existence. And so Jesus, with his arms stretched on the open on the hardwood of the cross, absorbing the way of this world, He's the meek and mild one who absorbs in God's love the arrogance of this world. He's the humiliated and suffering one who, in the love of God, absorbs the pride of this world. He is uh, full of kindness and friendliness and gentleness. Again, in God's love, absorbing all the hatred and enmity and violence this world can muster. And in so doing, as he looks powerless, as the last and the least, he's revealing the ultimate power of God over this world. That's what Philippians 2 is talking about. It says, Jesus, though he is in the form of God, gave it all up. He emptied himself, became the last and the least, becoming like a servant and a slave. And therefore he was also highly exalted, given the name above every name, so that the name of Jesus, every 
me in heaven and on earth and under the earth should bend and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. Jesus gave it all up, was the last and the least. And in that, he was enthroned as the Lord of all. That's what Psalm 2 is talking about. It's pointing to that irony at the heart of, of the work of God. And I say it's deep comedy because it looks like tragedy, right? Israel just suffers setback after setback. Jesus Christ, it looks like a continual retreat and a gradual continual retreat to the cross. And it looks like defeat. And yet at the last second, Christ turns what looks like sure defeat into a comedy. God indeed gets the last laugh as Jesus Christ uh, conquers the grave. He, he rises from the dead. And so maybe in your life, you feel like you've been on a continual retreat. You've suffered setback after setback after setback. Maybe you feel that the people of God, the church, again, the same, that it's been a continual retreat. And yet, it is we in Christ, as we are united to Jesus, we will share, we will get that last laugh with God. What looks like sure defeat will be turned to joy and laughter with God. We will, we will be with Christ and we, we, will, we will see as God sees this world, as he has the nations in derision, we will share in that last laugh with God. As it was with our Savior, so it will be with us.